Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, I just wanna make sure because I'm my headphones are hurting me. All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you to everyone for joining us uh, today. And we are going to um, just share some information about the higher ed leadership, uh, higher education leadership's PhD specialization here in the School of Education at Colorado State University. And uh, to begin, though, I want um, uh, just a couple of introductions um, of the uh, faculty and staff are going to be talking first. Our students who are going to be sharing their experiences are going to have a chance to introduce themselves later on here. But um, first, uh, we'll say, we'll say, I'll say, um, Dr. D.L. Stewart, my pronouns are he, him, and they, them. A professor in the School of Education and one of the faculty and advisors in the Higher Education Leadership Program. Um, I'm coming to you and we are um, coming to you as a as sort of institutional representatives um, of Colorado State University, which is on the ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute Nations. Um, unceded and ceded ter territory through military incursion and treaties, and Colorado State University owes its existence uh, to the 1862 Morrill Act, which was the engine of uh, indigenous dispossession here in the Western uh, part of what is now the United States. And so we hold that um, with honor. Um, and deep sense of responsibility as we engage in the work of preparing and educating uh, students to be higher ed administrators. So that's me in the sort of a general <laughs> platform. Uh, Dr. Dockendorf, will you um, introduce yourself as well? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Carrie Dockendorf. I'm an assistant professor in the higher ed leadership program. And this is my second year um, teaching in this program. Um, yeah, and Kelly can go ahead. Oh, I'm, and uh, I use they, them, their pronouns. Almost forgot that part. <laughs> hey everyone. So my name is actually Kelly. I am not Dr. Munoz. I don't know why it showed up as her name. Um, so that was what all the weird faces were. I was trying to figure out why that happened. Anyway, um, so my name is Kelly. My pronouns are she, hers. Um, I am the graduate programs coordinator in the School of Education. So that means that I work with all of you as prospective students while you are just thinking about going to graduate school. I assist with the application process. And then once you're admitted, um, I work with you kind of through all of your milestones and everyone's favorite piece of paperwork. That's kind of my jam. So welcome. All right, well, let's get this party started. We'll just be going through uh, this PowerPoint for a bit and then take it down and go ahead and start with uh, introduction, um, conversation rather. Uh, so, so our agenda, we're just going to do an overview of the program, talk a bit about our faculty and their research interests, the application process, hear from our students who are gathered, gathered with us today, and some open time for Q&A. So because we're going to have that question and answer time toward the end, we're going to ask um, and let you know that we will answer questions during that period. Um, so if you want to hold your questions until then or put them in the chat, we'll um, keep track of those, but we'll answer all of those questions toward the end. Um, and we'll all still be here all the way through the end to be able to handle those. Okay, I am going to pass it off to Dr. Dockendorf. All right, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Higher Ed Leadership Program. Um, you can move to the next slide. Uh, so our program um, is meant to prepare you to take on um, senior administrative roles or faculty roles in the institutions of higher ed and related organizations. Uh, our teaching, our research, et cetera, is, comes from a critical perspective. Um, we teach students to have a strong understanding of higher ed structures, systems, 
equity and justice, as well as how to be a transformational leader. Uh, we're largely a, or we're a hybrid format when it's not COVID times, um, meaning our um, most of our coursework is online, and then we have two face-to-face -face, um, interactions, typically in January and July. Um, and then you're applying for our PhD in Education and Human Resources, um, and it's the higher ed uh, leadership specialization, and that part will be reflected on your transcript. Mm -hmm. So for our requirements in curriculum, we require a minimum of 30 credits of higher education administrative curriculum, a minimum of 30 credits of research. You'll do a prelim, two preliminary exams, both written and oral defenses. Uh, you'll um, be required to submit a peer reviewed article. Then you'll have your dissertation proposal as well as your final dissertation defense, and then you'll become a doctor. <laughs> And now I'll turn it back over to Dr. Stewart for faculty. Okay. We're going to share a little bit about our faculty, particularly those who are current, who currently, as of this year, are accepting advisees, um, and also some of which also teach courses in the program. These are not all the faculty who teach. Our faculty come from across the School of Education, um, some with specific content expertise in higher education and others whose content expertise are in areas related to higher education which show up in the curriculum. So they're in alphabetical order here. Uh, Dr. Sharon Anderson, um, who teaches our uh, professional ethics course, has expertise in counseling, career development, counseling for justice, and higher education leadership. Dr. Ryan Barone, uh, who is some of our, our faculty and advisors in the program are full-time administrative professionals. Um, so they come as scholar practitioners into the HEL program. Dr. Barone is one of those with an emphasis in social justice leadership, equity, uh, particularly an emphasis on two-year colleges, violence prevention, and critical qualitative research methods. Uh, Dr. Dockendorf, who you've already heard from, their research is focused on trans students in higher education, measurements of gender and sexuality, and exploring new strategies for disrupting binary measures of gender. And one of our residents, quantitative, critical quantitative methodologies experts. Dr. Johnson, Dr. Jen Johnson, is another one of our scholar practitioner administrative professionals with a focus on service learning, campus food insecurity, co-curricular community engagement, and racial attitudes. And then just three more folks who will highlight, uh, Dr. Susana Munoz, who is unable to be with us today, but is the program director for the Higher Education Leadership Specialization. Her research focuses on the experiences of minoritized college students in higher education, campus climate, identity development, and activism for undocumented and DACA Latinx students. We also have Dr. Kathy Cisneros, another scholar practitioner administrative professional here at Colorado State University. Uh, expertise in research areas are in diversity, social justice, and seeking ways to create equity within the university setting. Uh, and then myself, uh, with my emphases focused on history and philosophy of higher education, the use of intersectionality to examine institutional systems and structures that affect the post-secondary experiences, learning, growth, and becoming of minoritized students. Uh, and I also, my other hat is that I am a co-leader for the Student Affairs and Higher Education Masters of Science uh, program, also within the School of Education. So let's talk a little bit about our students. So in a minute, you're going to hear directly from our students, um, but our students, and we can move to the next slide. Um, our cohorts are comprised of a variety of students who fall along um, various gender identities. Um, the cohorts are also racially diverse, come from all time zones in the US. So some people are taking class until 1030 at night on the East Coast. Um, then we've got our Pacific Coast friends who are in class a little earlier, um, as well as internationally. So we, in this first cohort um, started this year, we have someone taking classes, um, joining us from New Zealand. Um, and like I said, you'll get to hear some more um, 
more thoughts from our students in a little bit. And now Kelly, would you like to take it away with the application process? Absolutely. Okay, so there are a couple of things that you'll need to have in order to be eligible for admission. Um, the first is that you do have to have a master's degree from a, rec reg uh, a regionally accepted post-secondary institution or a CSU recognized international institution. So um, for your international programs, um, well, in, in, in both, you really need to have at least um, a 27 to 30 credit master's program to be eligible because those credits will um, be counted toward your net total 90 credits for the curriculum. So you have to take 60 credits post admission. Um, and then um, you do have to have a minimum 3.0 GPA from your last degree earned and a minimum of two years postmasters um, professional work experience. And that work experience should be related to higher education. You should have that before you apply. And always my favorite bullet point of these presentations, GRE scores are not required. So you don't have to worry about submitting those or taking that exam. Okay, and so, there are several pieces that you'll need to complete your application. You can start your application at any time and go back and look at these pieces, upload them, and then submit your application. So this is not something that you have to do all in one step. Um, you will need to submit a purpose statement it's typically two to three pages. However, this program does not have um, a minimum or maximum word count or page limit. Um, your purpose statement prompts will be listed in the application. So there are, I think for this program, three to four specific things that the faculty would like you to speak to. So we don't have them listed here, but like I said, once you log into the application system, you can see those and you can go back and work on them. But primarily they're going to focus on your personal and professional goals and how this program aligns with them and how your experiences um, and your views of equity and inclusive excellence um, also align with your, your goals. You'll need to submit at least three recommendation letters. You can actually submit up to five, but a minimum of three are required. And those should be professional references from people who are able to speak um, to your abilities as a um, doctoral student, um, as a researcher, um, and or a scholar practitioner. You'll also need to submit your resume or VITA, either is fine. And then official transcripts from all colleges that you've attended. So this includes both your undergraduate and your graduate work. If you're a CSU student, you don't need to submit your CSU transcripts, um, but the university does require official transcripts for every school at which you've earned college credit. Um, the only exception to that really is if you had dual enrollment credit while you were in high school. So um, when you're submitting your application, if that applies to you, you'll still list that school. And then there'll be a place where you can say, I attended such and such college uh, while I was duly enrolled and the um, admissions office staff will see that and um, waive that particular transcript, but all others will be required. So once your applications are completed and submitted on December 1st, um, then the faculty will review and decide who to invite for interviews. And if you're invited for an interview, uh, then you will also submit a writing sample. And then we will send you more information about that writing sample. Um, I believe typically have a couple weeks to get that in. Um, 
And then you'll also have an interview with your faculty and uh, we'll assign you an, a current HEL student as your buddy to also talk with throughout the application process. All right. Okay, thank you, Kelly. So um, I'm gonna take a beat here and point out um, this is something I should have pointed out beginning in the beginning. There is a Q&A button um, there at the bottom center of your screen, which you have, uh, which you can use to deposit questions now, if you would like. You just, you don't want to lose them. You've got a question. You can go ahead, pop it in there now. We'll pull from that bank um, as we, when we get to the Q and A portion. Uh, but for now, and I recognize that the closed caption, like the closed captioning subtitling here at the bottom of the screen, only works when I'm talking. Uh, so I apologize for that, but we do want to take a moment now and invite, we have five students with us. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so that you can see them and not me, um, who are going to share their experiences in the program and they'll introduce themselves in um, whatever order they would like to go. Okay. Hi folks, my name is Ashley Rendria, she, her, hers. Um, I work at CSU in the College of Business as an academic advisor. Um, I am a second year in the program. Um, weird to say, but that's me. Megan, why don't you go? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, Bree, sorry. Okay, and then I'll just popcorn to the next person. Hi, everyone. I'm Bree Serrano. I use he, him, or they, them pronouns. Uh, I am a fourth year student and uh, Dr. Stewart and Dr. Dockendorf are my co-advisors. And right now, um, I don't know when we're supposed to talk about our experience, but I'm, I'm working on my qualifying exams right now and um, proposal prep for my dissertation. So I am done with coursework at this point and it's been a long time coming and I'm so happy I am done. I'll, I'll pass it on to Megan. Cool. Thanks, Bree. Hey, y'all. Um, Megan Pendleton, she and her pronouns. Uh, I am a second year um, in the EHEL program uh, and the assistant director in the Office of LGBT Life at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, still very much in the thick of coursework um, with um, Ali and Ashley there, um, but I'll pass it over to Jade. Hello, my name is Jade Silva Tovar. Pronouns are she, her, ella. And um, I'm currently at Texas Tech University as the senior director in the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I'm um, in the first year cohort, our little shirts um, that we have. So um, I'm excited to be here. And I'm also in Lubbock, Texas, which is the ancestral homelands of the Comanche and Mus Muscalero Apache nations. I'll popcorn it over to Ali. Thank you, Jade. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Ali Raza. I use he, him, his pronouns. I serve as the Assistant Director for Involvement uh, at Colorado State University. Um, so I am on campus and on the ancestral lands of the Cheyenne, Ute, and the Arapaho nations and peoples, um, as Dr. Stewart mentioned earlier. Um, I am a second year in the HEL program alongside uh, the wonderful Ashley and Megan. Uh, and uh, just to give you a little frame of where, where, where we are in, in, the, in the program right now. We are just finalizing our first initial submission of committee construction. Um, and so with that, I will yield to whomever is going to go next. Um, so before we get to Q&A, just want to have the current students um, go ahead and share how they came to this program and why they chose the HEL program at CSU specifically. Um, so anyone want to jump in? So uh, I could start real quick. I didn't even say where I was or what I do for a living. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm not floating around just doing nothing, uh, which is fine if you are. So um, yeah, so I, I run the LGBT Center at Cal Poly Pomona, which is a part of the Cal State system. And I'm also an adjunct faculty in ethnic and women's studies uh, on campus as well. So I teach um, uh, and I'm a fellow. I have a fellowship that I'm part of. Um, uh, I am in Southern California, so I'm on the land of Tongva folks in LA County. Um, and 
So yeah, uh, how I got into the program, well, I applied. I, it actually had a different director at the time. This was about, Jesus, three years ago, four years ago, I was applying. Um, and I got in, our cohort looks very different than newer cohorts. And I think the model is definitely different. I really appreciate though the changes that have been made. I will say that, and I don't wanna speak for my cohort. Um, my experience in my cohort has been very much around advocacy, ensuring quality um, professors, equity, justice, and our cohort did a lot of movement with that. And to be honest with you, like the faculty, there have been changes. Um, and I really appreciate just having our feedback taken seriously. Um, and so I really love that about the program. I do love the fact that I am treated like a human. And I know that sounds very basic, um, although I've heard horror stories about people being dragged by their advisors or faculty, and it's just not a humane experience. And I've had a lot of traumatic events happen during the program. And I will say that the first question is always, how are you as a person? right, um, for me to function. And so I appreciate that. I love my cohort. Um, half of them are white. And so, you know, that may look different for other cohorts, um, although I still love them, right? Um, and I do love the faculty and I really was drawn to the research interest. And honestly, that's the biggest part of it is that I was accepted into other programs, but the research component was most important to me to know that they will be there in order to support um, what I will want to do and what I want to publish. So, thanks. I would um, echo what Bree said specifically about um, the research interest. So I was, um, I finished my master's program in 2014 um, and really wanted a program where the faculty had interest that I was interested in. I also wanted um, a program that was really solid um, and grounded in justice and equity. And although you read that right on everybody's pamphlets and brochures and all of those things, what I was hearing about the ATL program felt like it was um, more aligned, right? That there wasn't such a gap between like the enacted and espoused. Um, and I definitely think that that, so I wrote down like YCSU, but also why I stay, because there are moments when I'm like, I mean, do I really want to continue? Like this, it's a lot. And so for me, like why I stay, definitely the faculty, like they, like Bree said, um, I feel like Dr. Munoz often talks about wanting to make um, this a humanizing experience. Uh, and so I think the, the faculty that I've encountered so far have just, just a very critical approach to the work, um, which is unlike what I was used to. And so that was refreshing. Um, the cohort model, I really enjoy that. I, I love being able to like get to know other cohorts during the summer residency, even though we haven't, we didn't have that this year, but um, it is really nice to see and have other cohorts kind of model how to show up. I think uh, I learned a lot from watching Bree's cohort in action and being like, oh shoot, like they have, I think in many ways, given me permission to be like, no, you can speak up and talk about things, right? Or issue or address issues that you see in this program. Um, so I appreciate that. And then I would say finally is the learning experience. I feel like I have learned and unlearned so much. It's like my brain is gonna explode and like so much about myself as well that um, I appreciate um, the, the learning process. I appreciate the environment and the space that the faculty and that everybody is sort of cultivating to um, to really help uh, to really help make like change. Although it sounds really cliche, but really like move the needle in higher education. So I'm excited about uh, being a part of that. So yeah. To echo what um, Megan said, Megan was actually my buddy through the process. So. Um, if that even that experience is you know Megan let me know like you know this is buddy but it's kind of like you know we're having this conversation I'll give feedback and so just that open honesty I think um it is really important but also for me CSU was the only program that I applied to part of that was um Dr. Munoz is my sorority sister and having seen her scholarship um, and been a mentor to me through uh, probably about 20 years now, um, but then that focus on the justice and equity and then seeing that in the faculty research and scholarship. Um, and so for me, that was really important. That's what I wanted out of the investment that I was going to be making in 
myself in my educational journey. And so throughout this whole process, truly it has been a humanizing experience. I do not feel scared to ask questions. Um, you know, I think, especially in your first year, you're not sure what to expect. And so um, being first generation college student, Latina, like it, having faculty that actually care. And I think I, I see that so much now when people in other doctoral programs or have gone through a doctoral program and they, they're almost like, oh, how is it? And I'm like, it's great. I love my cohort. I love my faculty. And it's, it's their reactions like, oh, okay, well, wait till you get in further. And I'm like, no, um, I, I think it's going to be hard. Yes. But, you know, I know that should anything ever come up that I need support, I can reach out to um, my cohort and faculty members and knowing that I'll be seen as, you know, needing to take care of self. So that is why I'm, I started and then why, of course, I'm continuing on and just started. So I can share a little bit. Um, definitely echo what, what folks have already already shared so far. I um, I applied because I was, I was really itching to get back into, into the classroom. I was working full time already at Colorado State University. And so um, I had the, the unique privilege and opportunity to, to to really get connected to and with the faculty a little bit ahead of time. And so I, I definitely acknowledge that that privilege that I have of being um, a staff member and a student um, presently at Colorado State University. Um, what has, and so I, I applied primarily because of the faculty. Um, CSU was the only, this program was the only program that I applied to. And, and for me, it was, I was, I'm either gonna do this program or I'm gonna, or I'm not gonna do do any any program. Um, and, and so I was, I was very thoughtful and intentional, intentional around why I was applying. And um, the, 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 the research, the humanizing aspect of the faculty, the just real talk from the faculty and, and just experiencing what, um, hearing from, uh, previous students and current students as well uh, about their experiences really gave me a lot of hope and gave me a lot of um, a, a little bit of courage to, to really just throw my head into the ring from from an application standpoint. Um, what's what's really kept me um, are continue to be the faculty. The faculty are, as uh, I believe Megan put it earlier, they, they really humanize or, or um, I believe Bree, Bree put this earlier. Um, they, they, they care about they care about the people and they care about the individual they care about uh, us um, and so as a student as a graduate student and as a full-time staff member I feel very supported and I feel like that my life matters I feel like that what what I have going on uh, personally professionally academically um, is all going to be heard and it's all going to, going to be um, uh, uh, listened to by by faculty be be they extensions or um, uh, in the in this uh, in the semester uh, uh, changes from a syllabi standpoint, or just uh, just compassion, just listening uh, to to what's what's going on, and so I, I thoroughly and immensely appreciate uh, appreciate that. Um, and then the other piece is, of course, the people, uh, the cohort, uh, as well as the the cross cohort uh, uh, collaboration and opportunities to engage with other folks in the uh, in in other elements of the program as well. And so that's been that's been really great because this is not a journey that. I believe I can do on my own. It's a journey that I feel like really takes a community uh, to, to really be able to, to, uh, to, to get through this, this process, to, to do this work. And so um, what, what, what really surprised me about this program that it, yes, it's, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of like intellectual uh, gymnastics and just a lot, a lot happening from, a, from an intellectual standpoint, uh, from, a, from, a, from a mind st uh, standpoint. But there's also a lot of, it's also a lot of heart work Right, and so that's one thing that I did not expect uh, was how much of your heart and how much of myself was going to really be uh, infused into literally every uh, uh, every class in, in, in the program throughout, from semester to semester, from assignment to assignment. And so that's something that uh, was uh, was unknown to me when I applied and when I when I started, but something that I appreciate immensely because it has really uh, aligned the personal. Uh, and the professional for me in, in a way to, to borrow uh, and, and to men from, from black feminist theory. Um, I think very similarly to everybody else, the faculty were a big draw. Um, Dr. Kathy Cisneros is a, one of my mentors for my graduate program. And as I started exploring programs, she very much was like, you need to think about CSU. There are changes happening. 
it's getting a lot more critical in the curriculum. And I think it's going to align more with what you're thinking about right now, um, because it wasn't initially on my radar. Um, and so then when um, Dr. Munoz came on and Dr. Stewart, um, right, the faculty just continued to grow and to be really awesome people and people who sometimes when I'm sitting in class, I still sweat through the entire class. But um, it's really great um, to be learning from those, those people. Um, so it, I think that some of the stuff that's kept me here so far, I think for sure, like folks have said, the compassion, right? So particularly as I think about the current state of the world and with everything with COVID, um, it was a lot, right? We went remote in the middle of the semester and our instructors very much looked at our syllabi and said, okay, how do we adjust and make this doable while you are trying to figure out the world and going remote? Um, it, in the spring, I asked for the first extension I've ever asked for in my entire life. And that was something that was really hard for me to do, um, but I felt really supported by my advisor who is Dr. Munoz and asking for that um, and her also being there to listen to what was going on in my life and why I may have needed that, that particular resource. So um, I really do feel seen as a person um, differently in this program. And I attended ASH last year, um, the Conference Association for the Study of Higher Education um, and got to meet a lot of other graduate students there. And there were spaces held for, for grad students. And this is not everyone's experience, right? We, not everyone has this positive of an experience. and there are a lot of folks of color there who talked about being the only person of color in their entire cohort. And I'm looking at my cohort going, we're predominantly folks of color. And um, it's a space that you do not see in a lot of um, academic spaces. So that's been a really different experience. Um, and then the cohort is phenomenal. And I just wanna also add that we have sub cohorts also based on geographical region and um, time zone. So that there's a smaller group of people you really get to like, um, get to know and do work with, um, which has been really nice. Um, so I'm with three West Coast folks. Um, and so we're just an hour apart from each other. Um, and then we have our own check-ins, like, how are we doing? We have our, a group me going so that we can check in on one another. So um, that's just what I want to share. But we can go ahead and jump in to questions. Um, Dr. Stewart, do you want me to read some of them? See how that goes? So what does the selection committee look for in our writing sample if selected as a finalist? Is there any time frame in which the sample should have been written, i.e. the last three years or something like that? So I can take this one. Um, it has to be uh, original work. It can be something you've previously written. However, there is a 10 page limit on it. So your capstone project is probably, I'm guessing, longer than 10 pages. Uh, and so you would need to craft something out of that um, in order to serve as the writing sample. Um, yeah. Kelly, you and wanna add I, anything? Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, I think the first part of that question is kind of like what faculty are looking for in selection. Um, and so you might wanna expand on this, but my understanding is that you all are just really looking for writing ability um, and, and skills. It's not that you're necessarily looking for writing on specific topics. Is that correct? Absolutely, sorry, I skipped right over the first part of the question. Um, Yes, we're really looking for um, writing skill um, and competency, uh, analytical skill, and how that comes across in your writing. Um, and yes, it doesn't have to be about a specific topic. It doesn't have to be about what you think you want to do your dissertation on. It doesn't have to be anything like that. Carrie, is there anything else you want to add? I don't think so, except for is, there is a prompt that they're given for that, like that outlines it when they're emailed, or when they're notified to do that, it, or? Um, sort of. Okay, at least <laughs> so, directions. Yes, so you'll <laughs> receive the directions about the writing um, sample when you're notified that you've been selected for an interview. Um, and, but, it's kind of broad because, like I said, we you know we're not looking for anything on a specific topic um, or anything like that. So the directions that you receive are really just more around um, when it needs to be submitted, the format, um, 
which it needs to be an APA, the page limit. Um, and, and so what we have written here from last year, and you know, I, I don't anticipate changing, but the faculty may change their minds. But what we sent to everybody last year was just that your paper should address a topic related, oh, it says related to your research interest, but it doesn't have to be your exact dissertation topic um, and be well organized, substantiated and synthesized around a central argument or, or thesis statement. So that's pretty broad, um, but, you know, I think, you know, like I said, and you know, like DL said, you know, we're, they're really just looking for, you know, your, your writing skills. Okay, I think this question is directed at our students a little bit. So what advice would you give applicants or newly admitted students who have been working professionally for a while and are perhaps a little rusty with academic writing? Any tips on how to prepare for the program? I will jump in just really quickly to say that Dr. Munoz structures that first class over the summer in a way that you're doing a literature review, but you are getting major feedback. Like we sat there for hours and um, Jade might be able to speak to what happened this summer, but um, we all read each other's papers and we would sit there for 20 minutes providing feedback. And that was really helpful, really hard sometimes because some of us are rusty, but I think that is one way that the program specifically provides support in that area. I don't know if others have more to share there. Uh, what's been helpful for me, because it's probably been, it was five years um, after I completed my master's. And before that, I waited seven years to even get my master's. So I'm all about taking breaks and taking my time. Um, but what was helpful um, that um, was, you know, there's a new APA. Um, so that was new and different. Um, so getting uh, the book and then there's a smaller book that I continuously refer to that and still Purdue Al. Um, but what's been helpful in this in Dr. Dockendorf's class this semester is really, they were like, just write. <laughs> and so it, and so really getting used to that. And um, for me, I think it's also, you know, taking the time to plan out further. I think as I've gone along, it has gotten easier to write. But in the beginning this summer, it was definitely um, planning out my time. Uh, for me, it's been good to do readings after work in the evenings. I can't write after work. I think my mind and what I need in order for space for writing um, after work is just not the best space for me. So my weekends are really my, my writing time um, and where I feel the, the best able to kind of be free and, and critically think because um, during the weekday, I think my mind is still on work. And so I've just just write and I then can edit and then I've used my cohort to really kind of get some feedback um, on some of their thoughts. I'll add briefly. Um, <clears throat> so when I was applying to the program, I was working on two book chapters. So for me, it wasn't necessarily about prepping of how, like, I think you'll learn that right through APA and all of that when you get feedback. It was more about me not taking feedback personally <laughs> and getting my ego out of the way uh, because I'm a Capricorn. And also, um, it also was more about how is this going to fit into my life? Because I have priorities and I don't really, I mean, even regardless of COVID, like I've been, I haven't had a social life in the past three years, um, very minimal, right? And even with COVID now, I'm like, I never talked to you all before. So um, it hasn't impacted me in the same way, which is probably TMI, but honestly, like really reprioritizing your time, right? Reallocating that for me was the biggest hurdle and the writing will happen, right? We're always, I mean, I'm even now getting feedback and DL and Carrie will rip it apart, which is fine. Um, that's what they're there for, right? So I think um, it's more about reorganizing your life and prioritizing this because this is going to be a significant part of your life for years. On that note, Bree, how significant, how many hours a week are people spending on their schoolwork? If you're like not so much into it and trying to just glance through things, probably six to eight. If you're really committed or able to allocate, I would say more like 12 to 15, but it depends on the person. I don't have kids or anything, so. 
I would also say that this, um, it kind of varies and depends on like what's happening in the semester, what's going on with life, what is due, all of those things. So pre-COVID, I know like I would spend all day Saturday at a Starbucks, like get there early in the morning and spend all day like reading and taking notes and stuff like that. And that was that like that wasn't the only day. It was like a day that I had like dedicated time to like really do it where I didn't have to worry about like other things going on. Um, you know, I would, you know, read after work or, you know, on Sundays or on the week, like when I had time to kind of sit and focus on it. Um, and also because sometimes some of the reading and some of the work that you're doing, it's like, it requires like all of your brain cells. And so um, it, it wasn't something that I could just be like, oh, let me just like kind of skim through this and see. So uh, I would definitely say it, it depends um, kind of on how you work and stuff like that. But I mean, it does, it, it takes, it's a part of your life. Like I, yeah, like there, there were times, um, I think last summer or last fall when we had like friends over and like they were all hanging out outside and I was like looking out the window and like reading queer phenomenology and like, I have to, I have to sit here inside and read this because that text is just too intense to try and do anywhere else, you know, but like it, 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 it will require time, like Bree says, it is a significant part of a part of your life. It's not like an afterthought, um, but yeah. Okay, um, this might be a question for our faculty. So is there a way for students to be involved in teaching or how can students help faculty in the program? Um, I don't think we have formal teaching opportunities, um, but uh, for me, um, with my advisees um, and some other students who expressed interest, I had some research that I was doing that I could have students get involved with. Um, and I know that a couple other uh, faculty in our program um, have done the same. And so there's been other research opportunities or writing opportunities where you can partner with maybe your advisor or someone um, in publishing something or getting some hands-on research experience. There are, um, with the Student Affairs and Higher Education uh, Master's Program, there are sometimes uh, teaching assistant opportunities available with those master's level classes. Um, Ali, I think you've done that um, or are doing that. Um, so sometimes the, those opportunities come with our, uh, with the master's program that's also in the School of Education. There's a question that came in over the chat, Ashley, that um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and throw in now. Um, someone asked about the doctoral committee and how advisors and other committee members are um, become part of that, that student's life, right? So at the point of admission, students are, uh, are assigned an advisor that can, that person can be changed. Uh, you can change who that person is later on. Um, but you're initially assigned an advisor upon the, uh, upon admission to the program, the other members of the committee. Um, so there needs to be two more committee members from within the School of Education, and then an outside committee member that is from um, beyond the School of Education within Colorado State. Uh, you have about a year um, after admission to um, compose the rest of that committee. Okay, um, And so those folks are uh, the student's choice some often should and should be probably with, with consultation uh, with the advisor um, and, and help and support from the advisor. Sometimes the external or outside committee member is um, a little hard for uh, our students to act, to identify and access because of the online nature of the program. And so getting to know who the um, who other faculty are is not always as simple, although I will say our SAHI residential master students also run into the same trouble and they are on campus. So, um, but that your advisor is there to help um, with identifying those other folks and thinking what, what do you need as part of your committee and helping you think through that process. Okay, what else we got, Ashley? Yes. Um, 
Any folks experience imposter syndrome at this level while applying during the program? I think I know the answer to this, but I'll just let someone jump in. Mine's yes. Anyone else? Absolutely yes. And 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 still to this day, to this very second, I'm like asking myself, why am I even on this panel? Right? Am I even the right person to be be here? Um, but you know, uh, go, going back to the application piece, like. If you are, if 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 you have a if you have a sensation, a feeling to uh, a want to to apply to to be interested in this program, I I recommend reaching out to faculty, reaching out to folks, uh, reaching out to current students, um, and 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 applying, right? Um, don't don't let yourself um, not have an opportunity. Don't tell. Don't give yourself. Don't say no to yourself before somebody else can. Essentially, right? Um, Give yourself that chance if um if at anything at all so um but yes the imposter syndrome is real um i'm gonna echo that so um dr stewart is my advisor and i think it was last year last semester i can't remember sometime you know time is all warped now but i sent him an email and i was like just like kind of pouring my heart out being like i don't know what i'm doing here I feel overwhelmed. Like you are the DL steward. How? What am I? How am I supposed to ask you? Like, what am I supposed to say? So I'm like, just going off in this email, just a mess. And so he emails me back, and he's like, "Okay, so um, imposter syndrome is real." And I was like, "Well, first of all, I didn't even say that, but okay." <laughs> we was like, "Imposter syndrome is real, but also like." Yes, I, but I'm also like just a person and I'm also like someone who's doing research and I am just, you know, out here navigating the world just as you are and I've been in that same situation and so um, I would say, as Ali said, yes, it happens, it still happens, it, I imagine it's going to continue but um, I really appreciate it being able to open up and share that with Dr. Stewart and have him kind of want to affirm that that was what was going on but also be like, we, I get it and let's figure out how we can navigate this together. And so, um, yes. I think uh, for me, for the process, um, I, I probably read 40 articles for a 10 page paper. And I think, <laughs> yeah, it's the, the perfectionist, right? And so I think in the summer when taking Dr. Munoz's class of just, you know, we've been socialized in education to have to feel like we have to be overachievers and we have to be perfect um, and really how we unlearn that and just show up as our authentic self. Um, that has been liberating for me, especially when it comes to writing and it comes to the readings of, you know, I don't have to be perfect. I'm learning. I'm in a learning environment. And I have to tell myself that when I start getting down that, that rabbit hole of like, well, I have to do this, I have to do this. And then I need to find more articles, more articles, more articles. And I, I have to take a step back and really just re remember that I, I am meant to be here. I was selected for a reason and it was because of my own skill and ability. And I always have to keep that centered because um, it's really easy to get stuck in, why am I doing this? Why am I here? Or to start comparing yourself to others. And I think with the cohort is, it's not comparing, but we're all in, a, a, I feel like we're family, right? And so I, I really think that that has helped me of, I want to be happy for somebody else's success and not feel that I need to compete with them. So we have a couple questions about um, faculty research interests and um, in reaching out before the application. So can students apply if their research interests don't directly align with a specific faculty member? Um, and should students be reaching out to faculty before the application deadline? I think Carrie and I are like eyeing each other to see who's going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> you know more. <laughs> um, you are welcome to reach out to a faculty member beforehand. Um, that does not have an impact on your chances of admission. Um, you do not have to find a faculty member that has your exact research interest. There are 
a thousand different things that folks could study within the field of higher education. And there's no way that any faculty in any program is going to be able to cover everything that anybody might be interested in. Um, I know my goal as a faculty member is as an, in, as an advisor is to help nurture the student's capacity to do the research that they want to do, not to do the research that I want to do. And so I've often had students whose research interests over the course of my career, not just here at Colorado State, um, whose research dissertation interests do not perfectly align with my own. And that to me is not relevant. It's about Am I able to help support you to do the research that you want to do? And yeah, I think those were the both parts of the questions, right? Okay. We do have one question asking about the delivery of courses, synchronous versus asynchronous. Sure. So all the courses are synchronous. Um, and I noticed there was another question about the in-person periods as well. So courses during the academic year are online, synchronous. We currently are using Zoom as the platform for that um, in the regular Zoom meeting platform, um, not the webinar um, format. During the uh, July period, which is when courses um, summer courses are taken one course in July over the course of a week um, when we are in person, um, actually in person. Um, it would be one week and um, the course would last Monday through Friday and it'd be like an eight to five, nine to five, something like that um, each day for five days, um, one course. Um, during the winter, when we have been able to be in person, it's a it's a long weekend, really. Um, and there, are, this last one had just a number of different workshops and sessions and whatnot that were meant to help amplify and supplement um, the coursework. Anything I said wrong in there, Carrie or Kelly, <laughs> or left out? <laughs> Just to add, um, when students are on campus here at Colorado State, I believe we book a number of rooms or set get rooms set aside at the Best Western and people get discounted rates and maybe um, share rooms and stuff like that. Um, so that to reduce costs and, um, for being here because um, in the summer it is a full week. Um, I think that was the other part of the question. Yeah, and I would just um, add to what Dr. Dockendorf said is that um, it, it is at your expense. So uh, the program doesn't cover travel or lodging expenses for you. So that is why a lot of people will share a hotel room and whatnot. One year, for a couple of years, there was a cohort that got together and rented an Airbnb um, for <laughs> half the cohort was in an Airbnb um, during that, that summer week. There, there was another piece to that question I saw that was about how folks, students, how y'all navigate that with your employers um, for time away and even time during the academic year for classes and homework and all that jazz. And just to confirm, one, at least one reference does need to be from a faculty member, correct? We have just had that question come in via chat. Um, do all faculty accept new advisees every year? Yeah. No, not all, not all faculty who teach in the program and are affiliated with the program accept advisees every year. What are some qualities and characteristics that prospective students have had that made them stand out um, and be successful in the application process? I think um, for us looking at applications, we're running, uh, looking for fit with the program. So is the cohort model, social justice emphasis, something that we see um, the, the fit um, working. And then, um, gosh, I don't know. Um, other things, uh, Dr. Stewart? 
so that is a key one. Um, I saw what you did there. That is a key one. The others, um, I would say, are also related to being able to demonstrate, and, and you can do this in multiple ways, um, capacity for grad level work um, for a program that's heavily centered around reading and writing. Um, the students will tell you they read a lot and they write a lot. Um, that, uh, and your references can help support that as well, that there's a clear um, um, reason and rationale for why the doctoral student, um, why, the do why the doctorate degree, rather, is relevant to your career and professional goals, right? Um, and so it's, this is not a, just a mere credentialing program. This is not a degree mill. Um, and so if you're just looking for a degree so that you can get um, a promotion, this is probably not gonna be the program for you. Um, it's really thinking about why, what can I do? What will I, will, what will I be able to do with this degree that I cannot already do right now? What will this extend and enable me to do, you know, um, in terms of scholarship, in terms of professional practice, in terms of service, et cetera. Um, and I would say we're also, we, this is a cohort model. Um, and so we are crafting a cohort um, as we go through the admissions process. Um, students, what is one thing you wish you would have known prior to starting the program, either about yourself or about the program? <laughs> I'm sorry, Ali and I are laughing because we're doing research right now with Dr. Oyan Poon, who's no longer with the program. And we talk about admissions and, and fit, and it's just funny that Carrie mentioned fit earlier. Um, so, uh, what was the question? Oh, well, we wish we would have known. Um, I'm so sorry. That was distracting. Honestly, like I said earlier, m my life is so vastly different in terms of priorities. Um, my family is most important to me, my partner sometimes. Um, like it really just depends on what your priorities are, right? And negotiating time and negotiating energy. Um, and yeah, it, it's not something that you could know beforehand until you actually experience, in my opinion, and also um, how brilliant folks are. And I definitely had that imposter syndrome. I still do. But even in regards to the faculty and thinking, God, I'm just trash and seeing them and they're not trash. And so knowing that, you know, they're there to genuinely help you um, and not being intimidated. And I think I still experience that sometimes, but they're really there to just make sure that you succeed in every way in your life. I want to be mindful of time, but there are a couple that I think could be answered pretty quickly. So um, let's see, what if folks don't know their exact research interests before entering the program? Faculty, you might have a better answer for that one. I wouldn't say you know, need to know exactly what your research is, but maybe, you know, ballpark area, pick a general topic that you know you want to go into and focus on that for um, writing through it in your essays. I would just add to that really quickly, um, because this is a PhD program, it is focused on research and scholarship and preparation for research and scholarship. One of the things you should be doing right now is thinking about what is it I'm learning and experiencing in my practice that I would like to investigate empirically, okay, um, and be able to demonstrate that in your application materials. Uh, are there graduate assistantships um, or are folks just generally working in higher ed? Do you want me to take that one? <laughs> so generally assistantships are not available with this program because you have to be enrolled in a one in on campus credit. However, um, sometimes opportunities can come up like um, Dr. Stewart was speaking about earlier with teaching with the student affairs program. Dr. Dockendorf has had some students assist them with their research. So 
it is possible um, when faculty have a need for assistantships, um, but this program doesn't have ongoing assistantships tied to it because of the distance component of it. Um, and then someone's asking about funding sources and scholarship opportunities. Um, so I'll just jump in really quickly to say, I know the School of Ed does provide some funding if you wanna go to conferences or professional development, if you are presenting at things. Um, I know a lot of folks in our cohort specifically get funding and su financial support from their home institutions. Um, so that tends to be an opportunity. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add in that particular area. Um, students, anybody want to share what their goals or plans are after they graduate th from this program? Sleep. No, just, just kidding. Now, just continue working, on unle unlearning, relearning. Just like like other folks have, I've already shared. This program is really like like just really done a lot for me, and I have so much more to continue to work and learn and unlearn. My cohort um, jokes because as we've gone through the program, we talk about institutions. And so we've talked about starting our own institution for higher learning. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I, it, for me, it's, it's really continuing on and advancing um, the work that I'm doing in, as an administrator. Um, kind of the big goal is one day to be a university president, so. I think, um coming in and I would say when I first started grad school, my master's program, I was like, I want to be a dean of students or a VPSA. And now I'm like, absolutely not. Like that is just not, <laughs> I think uh, just through this program and just like through some of the things that I've learned, but um, I don't know. I mean, I think about, um, so I'm doing like DEI work right now. So I think about what it looks like to continue to do that. Um, I think sometimes about like CD, uh, Chief Diversity Officer positions, but then I, I just don't know. Um, right now, I am kind of like playing around with the idea of like, what would faculty look like? Like faculty in a higher ed prep program, like that could be really, really cool. So now that's where I am, but like there isn't a hard and fast, um, you know, kind of this is where I'm heading and I'm okay with that for the moment. Yeah, I think really briefly, I think I'm heading in the direction of faculty in the Cal State system, um, but teaching undergrads, which I'm totally fine with, PhD students, uh-uh, I'm not touching us. Um, no, I'm not trying to do that. And I'm definitely not trying to be a VP or president because I want a life. Um, I, or a wife, but um, yeah, so that's where I'm at right now. And um, I'm totally fine with that. And if I move up in administration, great, um, but I'm definitely not trying to have work run all the things in my life. Okay. There's two questions left, but I do feel like we've touched on them with everything else, but I know some of the students have put their email addresses in the chat if anyone wants to reach out. Um, we will be um, sharing the recording and um, just to mention, Dr. Stewart did say that six credits is considered full time for a graduate student, so you are eligible for federal financial aid. And someone else asked about um, research interests if most are geared towards students or some are geared towards staff. Um, in, it's a variety for folks. So Ollie certainly does staff and Bree mentioned in the chat also that they do staff, faculty, and students. So just FYI. Um, that's it. I'll hand it over to Dr. Stewart for any last comments. All right. So we are, um, we, the recording is usually made available, correct? Yes. Um, so you'll be able to go back through and, and listen again. Um, I've, like Ashley said, the students are putting um, their contact information, email addresses in the chat. Um, there's also, you'll see it when you get the um, presentation, there's a slide that has all of their information on it as well. Um, and feel free to reach out after this. Um, I know there are probably other questions that will come to your mind uh, at midnight tonight. Um, or tomorrow morning, you know. Um, so feel free to reach out. Um, admissions and application questions, Kelly is your best source of information for that. Um, if there are questions you have, um, do you want to pose around faculty and courses and what they're like, um, either myself or Dr. Dockendorf or the students, 
um, could be able to uh, answer those kinds of things, depending on what perspective it is you're looking for. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, we're going to bid you adieu um, to enjoy the rest of your evening, night, um, or wherever part of the day you are in, um, in whatever part of the world you're in, rather. And again, thank you so much. And we hope that we see your applications. Do we just, <laughs> are you ready to stop, stop the recording, Ashley? Of, co of course I'm muted, yes. Uh, I was waiting for all of them to leave. And then there was like a couple lingering and I was like, I'm going to remove you now. <laughs> okay, perfect, lovely. All right, awesome. Thanks, okay. Ashley. Yeah, thank you. And I... I, I think the recording will come to me. I'm not sure, but I'll talk, connect with Barry and then I'll figure out how to get it online and share it. With yeah. Me. All right. Thanks for Sounds jumping good. in until last minute too. Oh, sure. No problem at all. All right. <laughs> Bye, Bye, Ashley.